Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Community Impact with the Lancaster Conservancy. Along with my colleague, Kelly Snavely, welcome to the Riparian Buffer Design presentation as part of Lancaster Water Week 2021. Water Week was launched five years ago as a community awareness campaign to celebrate the over 1,400 miles of streams and rivers in Lancaster County. These incredible water resources have driven economic development and agricultural growth in our community for generations, and these streams and rivers are the source of our drinking water. Nearly half of these 1,400 miles are polluted or impaired, but the good news is we can solve this problem in our lifetimes with focused action. Please visit LancasterWaterWeek.org to register for one of our remaining events still taking place this week. While visiting LancasterWaterWeek.org, we invite you to take the Water Week Pledge, which includes three simple action steps we can all take to be a part of the solution. Water Week is successful because of many partnerships. And this, this afternoon, I want to thank our presenting sponsor for the last five years, Turkey Hill Dairy. I also want to recognize the Campbell Foundation, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Keystone 10 Million Tree Partnership, Lancaster County Community Foundation, Black Swama, High Foundation, City of Lancaster, Brookfield Renewable, Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, Atley Hall, Eurofins, Flyway Excavating, Fulton Bank, St. Boniface Brewing, Lancaster County Clean Water Consortium, Lancaster Newspapers, Stroud Water Research, Lancaster General Health, Land Studies, Landis Homes, Science Factory, Inframark, Natural Light Films, Octorora Native Plant Nursery, Lancaster County Conservation District, Modern Art, and Donegal Trout Unlimited. Oh my gosh, that's an incredible list. We are so thankful for their continued support. A portion of all of those sponsorship dollars go to support the Lancaster Clean Water Fund being administered by the Lancaster Clean Water Partners and the Lancaster County Community Foundation to support on the ground implementation. There is funding available for large and small scale clean water projects. And you can learn more by searching Lancaster Clean Water Fund or visiting Lancaster Clean Water Partners website. Now it's my great pleasure to welcome Kelly Gutshaw, the president and landscape architect with Land Studies. And beginning the presentation is Kate Austin, the green infrastructure asset coordinator with the city of Lancaster. Welcome Kate. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk a bit about uh, riparian buffers. Um, and so I think we have a really great presentation for you to talk a bit about design considerations, um, as well as installation, maintenance, all the, all the important factors. Um, so I'll get started. Uh, yep, let me see. Excuse me one second, having a little trouble advancing. Um, I'm going to stop my share and restart it. Apologize for the inconvenience here. Okay, there we go. Now we're in business. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to start today just talking a little bit about what exactly is a riparian buffer. So here in Lancaster County, I'm sure that you have um, seen a number of these um, being installed over the past several years. Um, and uh, so we're talking about the area of vegetation surrounding um, adjacent to a stream, a lake or a wetland, and it can be a combination of trees, shrubs, and other perennial plants. And we're going to manage this a little bit differently than, than the surrounding landscape. And um, these we really want to have a dense vegetated buffer that is going to help protect the stream and offer a number of benefits. And so it's going to give us a level of protection during flood events. Um, the roots of the plants are really going to help to keep the stream bank stable, um, which is very important 
sure you're all familiar with seeing some of our eroded streams um, here in the county. Um, and this is a great way to help stabilize those stream banks and keep them in better condition. Uh, once the vegetation grows up and uh, can create a canopy over the stream, this can help cool the water. And this is critically important for the fish, the insects and the microinvertebrates, all the other life that's in the, in the stream. Um, really depend on having those cool water temperatures, um, especially our trout streams, um, our high quality streams. Trout really benefit from cooler water temperatures. Uh, so that's a important piece. And of course also provides important wildlife habitat and corridors through our community. So it's a great opportunity to, um, to create this connectivity for wildlife. So when we think about a multifunctional buffer, um, we are talking about a riparian forest buffer that is going to provide some additional benefits. And so it could be planted with plant species that uh, could be available for harvesting. So, uh, so in this photo, we see some blueberries, might also be uh, nut trees, woody florals, um, forbs, and even potentially woody biomass um, uh, to do some selective harvesting of timber. Um, and so, uh, so just to increase the amount of benefit that our riparian buffers can provide, not only to the natural environment, but to the humans who are caring for them as well. So we are gonna be talking today about a really exciting new document that the city of Lancaster has um, worked on um, in cooperation with land studies. So the city of Lancaster applied for a grant through DCNR to install riparian buffers throughout the city and in adjacent municipalities. One of the first things that we noticed as we started approaching our riparian buffer um, project was the lack of resources for sites that are not agricultural sites. Uh, so the sites that we were looking at for our uh, riparian buffers in the city and in our surrounding more suburban municipalities didn't look like you know, an open farm field um, and, um, and maybe weren't as spacious as some of those um, larger agricultural buffers that were being installed. We were dealing with much smaller constrained spaces and it really required a different design sensibility, some different considerations even for maintenance and care. Um, and so we really wanted to really dig into those types of issues and be able to provide that kind of information to our city residents who might be considering um, installing a buffer on their property. Um, we do have a number of residents who live right along um, the Conestoga River and, um, and other tributaries in the city. Um, but, um, and to uh, communities through, you know, throughout the watershed that would also benefit from this information. So we're really excited with the end product that Land Studies has created. And we're gonna take a walk through that today and we'll be able to share this as a resource with you after, after the presentation. So just to kind of take a look at um, the different, um, different aspects of the guide, we're gonna be walking through everything from design to installation to maintenance, looking at uh, existing conditions of the site, really thinking about different uh, planting strategies and preparation um, uh, strategies for installation and maintenance is really a very critical piece to the success in the future of these riparian systems. And we're going to take a deep dive into all of those. So we are looking at several different types of um, types of properties as we think about riparian buffers. And so the, the first that we'll look at is the residential single family property. So this is going to be a home that is um, built along either a river or along a stream or a drainage swale where there would be an opportunity to improve that buffer area. But we wanna take into consideration um, certainly some uh, design questions uh, as this is you know, someone's backyard that we're talking about, um, as well as that, you know, the maintenance and care um, that might be um, being done by a homeowner or they might be hiring someone on to do that. Uh, we're also gonna talk, 
talk about parks and public property. And um, so for installations that are a municipal property, we have some other de design considerations. These are gonna be features that are gonna be maybe heavily used by the public um, and that uh, perhaps have been maintained in a, in a certain way for a very long time. And so changing the uh, that design paradigm of how they look and how they function um, will be something to consider. Another one that we'll look at is um, a commercial properties um, owned by a single landowner. And so we've had the great opportunity um, through our work through the DCNR grant to get to partner with um, some single landowner um, commercial properties like DART over in East Lampeter Township who had a really wonderful area of river frontage and was really interested in creating a healthy riparian buffer um, on their property and had ample property to, to do that. And so this is, can be a really great opportunity for getting these great practices in the ground. And then the last that we'll talk about a bit is um, the multifamily communities, um, in particular HOAs. Um, so there's some, you know, even even different design considerations there, maintenance strategies um, uh, to consider when we're thinking about a um, a multifamily community. Um, different opinions on um, on aesthetics to consider, and we'll talk about all of those uh, all of those considerations. So the first that we'll talk about is the, the single family residential setting. So in, you know, in these examples, so, um, you know, we often see that we have a property owner who um, they either may love the view that they have of the river or stream on their property, or they might be at a bit of a loss of how to, how to best manage it. And they might be dealing with some issues like some erosion of the stream banks, um, and um, some issues with some localized flooding uh, during heavy rain events. And there's these, uh, these types of properties present some challenges to an individual property owner. We can see steep banks that are hard to keep vegetated. So we see this bare soil um, and that contributes to erosion during significant flood events. Um, we can see that, um, you know, just planting right along the top of the bank, it can reduce visibility of the river. And often when people buy a property that is a riverfront property, that's a big concern of theirs. They want to really be able to preserve that, that view. Um, and that's, that's an important part of why they invested in the property that they did. So we really wanna take that into consideration. Um, and access to the river might really be a challenge with steep slopes. So with, the, uh, with residential properties that have a stream that might cross through the property, we have a lot of the same, same issues. Um, and so in addition to the, those issues that we described with the Riverside installation or the Riverside properties, uh, we might be looking at issues with invasive plants. And this actually can happen in, in either setting. Um, invasive plants that's you know, become established those seeds travel along the stream or along the river and um, really become, uh, become part of the landscape and can become really a difficult thing to maintain and to remove. Um, and so that's something that we really want to think about in our, uh, in our design. Um, access to both sides of the stream is often a, a problem or a challenge. And so we um, will want to uh, think about that and uh, of course, the uh, frequent flooding events that can cause uh, both uh, flooding issues on the property, but then also can bring in that weed seed the, um, that uh, contributes to those invasive species. So when we think about public properties, um, and uh, these are our, you know, our more municipal installations, uh, we have these beautiful open spaces um, that are in our parks. Uh, so here in the city of Lancaster, we have a number of these. I think in particular about Longs Park with this, uh, with this example, we have a small tributary um, that runs through the park. Um, and uh, what typically the way it had been maintained was tall trees and grass and not a lot of plant diversity. Um, and really an effort to keep maintenance to a minimum. Um, you know, municipal staff are really stretched in what they are able to maintain on a regular basis. So um, adding in complexity and diversity to that plant palette is often met with maybe a little bit of resistance. And so creating 
a planting design and then an associated maintenance strategy that is simple and effective and cost effective is really important. But these streams, we're going to see a lot of the same issues that we see on residential properties. Um, um, we're going to have issues with frequent flooding and wet conditions. Invasive plants are always a challenge. Um, there are often small crossings or bridges that are intended for pedestrians. And it's a common issue that if they're not sized properly, it can actually impede the flow of the stream, especially in heavy rain events, and cause flooding in the area. Um, and uh, so that's something to consider. Um, and, uh, you know, and then in, in addition to all of this public access and thinking about security um, and security and safety in a public space is something to consider as we think about, uh, you know, installing a dense planting pallet. So all a, a sort of a different slate of design considerations and maintenance considerations, similar but slightly different than, uh, than our residential settings. So then when we think about multifamily properties, um, it gets uh, maybe another layer of complexity because now rather than having a single property owner like we would in single family residential or commercial or municipal, uh, there are multiple property owners um, potentially with uh, competing or, um, or opposite views on aesthetics and um, and what they want to see in the community. So aesthetics are going to be a really important uh, piece of, of the design because often in a multifamily community um, with an HOA, there is um, the available open space is really a community resource. And so this we want to really invest in that and make this a really, um, a really wonderful space for residents to be able to get out and enjoy. So we might be thinking more about walking trails um, incorporated into the buffer. Um, and then of course, we're gonna be dealing with all, the same challenges as all the other sites. We're gonna be um, dealing with invasive plant species, we're gonna be dealing with um, maybe an existing maintenance paradigm of mowing right up to the stream because it's simple. Um, and again, maybe uh, the homeowners association doesn't have a huge maintenance uh, uh, budget for their entire property. And so, um, so we wanna be taking that in, into consideration similar to those municipal properties, you know, if we have a cost-effective, simple um, solution for, for maintenance for the property, that's really, really important, something that's easy to follow. Um, but in these areas, we can also deal with localized flooding issues. Um, and this can really be a challenge when it's affecting many, uh, many homeowners at the same time. So these are all things that we'll want to uh, take into consideration in our design. So in general, when we think about our typical considerations um, for a multifunctional riparian buffer, um, certainly if it's residential, but possibly even uh, commercial and as well as municipal and multifamily views and access are really, really gonna be important. Um, these are spaces where people um, have uh, either invested as their home um, or it might be their workplace and having views of um, at a wonderful resource like a stream or a river is something to really take advantage of. Um, access to the, um, the stream or the river might be, um, uh, there might be different takes on that. And so um, in a, on a commercial property, there might not be a lot of concern about access to, to the river. Um, this, um, and, um, or there might be concerns about um, limiting public access because it is a private commercial property. Um, for a homeowner, the question might be about access to get a kayak in the river or to um, be able to get out and explore a little bit along the stream bank. Um, and so these are all different things we'll think about. And again, with the HOAs, we might be thinking about uh, trails or pathways. And that might also be a consideration in other residential and municipal settings. So aesthetics, again, is something that we'll be thinking about. Maintenance is going to be a really key piece, and um, and I know Kelly is going to talk more about this further in the presentation. This is you know such a critical piece to the ongoing success of a riparian buffer, um, and can be a real challenge. And so we just want to make sure that we really emphasize um, just how important that is to have a good strategy 
from the very beginning um, so that uh, it doesn't get away from us and that pressure of invasive plants that can move along the waterway um, really become an issue. Uh, we might be looking at um, some other uses um, from recreation, also education. Uh, so certainly in our municipal parks, these are great opportunities for public education, environmental education, but that might also be the case on our commercial property or even in the multifamily. How wonderful to have signage about the, uh, the natural environment in the area. And so these are all things that we'll wanna keep in mind. So the benefits of a multifunctional riparian buffer are uh, just really fantastic. So uh, the first one we talk about is maintenance. So um, certainly it's a, it's a challenge and something that we absolutely want to address, but it can also really eliminate, um, not totally eliminate, it will shift the, the cost burden of the maintenance of the property. A regular mowing schedule is expensive and time consuming, especially if we're thinking about a large area like a municipal park or a large commercial property. Uh, there might be a, you know, a maintenance crew member who is spending eight hours once every two weeks mowing the area. And that's a really big time investment. So if instead we can be changing that maintenance protocol towards caring for a system that is going to establish itself through layers of plants that aren't going to require that type of mowing, but might require different types of attention, like weeding in areas and invasive control, things like that. Um, it can really provide a benefit in the end for the homeowner. In terms of water quality, it's a no-brainer. Riparian buffers are fantastic for water quality and really one of the most important things. And so uh, this is really going to be very important. Um, might be for an individual homeowner who uh, really values that. Certainly for municipalities who are required by, uh, by regulations to be uh, concerned and to have plans for improving water quality in their communities. So uh, this is something that, uh, that is a really important benefit. Uh, reduced chemicals. So we're gonna be using a lot of native plant species in riparian buffers. And so these native plant species are hopefully not going to require the number of pesticides. In fact, we want them, we want them to be eaten. We want our native, uh, our native insects and our, um, our native wildlife to be able to uh, depend on this new plant palette um, that is going to sustain them. And so, um, so we'll reduce the need for, for pesticides and herbicide treatments. Though there might be need, the need for some in the beginning of installation as we're getting a handle on the invasive pressure. Plant diversity is, can be really fantastic and, um, and really beautiful. And so as we think about those aesthetic considerations, um, bringing in a wide variety of native plant species that are well suited to this environment and will perform well in this environment uh, will really be wonderful for the site. Um, and again, habitat, uh, will, uh, this will be uh, very important for birds and other wildlife species in the area. And again, creating that connectivity through the community of, um, of green spaces that wildlife can travel through, um, that's really important for their health and well-being. And riparian buffers, lastly, can really be a boon to property value. So uh, really having a um, a dedicated, mature, established, healthy riparian buffer really can add a lot of value to a property. Um, so um, it's something that, um, that is, provides great benefit to the landowner. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly to get into a little bit more of the, uh, the details of our uh, design considerations. Thanks, Kate. And uh, I'm gonna get this. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So Kate's reviewed all of the all the benefits, looking at all of the the different um, constraints. Everyone's looking at this now, and I think this is the reason that we put this this booklet together, this guidebook. Is how do we do this? How do we go about it? And the guidebook is really kind of a um, more detailed, more of a recipe book per se, of how we can establish these riparian buffers. 
What I want to do in this presentation as we go down through it is to really highlight how we broke this out into some critical elements of the um, establishment and the design so that you can get an idea on what's the best approach, looking at the site conditions, what are some of the things that really make a, make a big difference. Um, we're gonna be looking at some planting strategies. And what we did was we broke out these planting strategies so that each landowner, given all of these different constraints and how these different sites are different, um, can come up with and kind of put together a planting that works for them. So we tried to break it all down and put it into something that is able to, you're able to mix and match and almost put together a, a planting strategy that works for what you want to do on your site. Then we're going to talk about actually how it gets planted and we're going to really look at the um, key elements of, of maintenance, which is a, a critical component of everything. So we'll start with existing conditions and existing site conditions and um, First is really understanding what the existing vegetation is. Um, you know, it's pretty simple if you have mowed lawn, um, but if you have vegetation that's there already, it's really important to understand, you know, what type of vegetation that is before you start planting trees in it or you start planting herbaceous plants or, or something like that. Um, if you already have invasive species in that area, they need to be eradicated. And we'll be talking about that um, a little bit later. Soil conditions. Um, everyone often thinks because it's adjacent to a stream or adjacent to a waterway, it's gonna be wet. Um, that's not always the case. And as you saw from some of the photos that, that Kate had, there is often a disconnect between the stream and the water elevation and the floodplain and the stream banks because of those deeply incised banks. It's so important to understand that oftentimes those banks create a separation between the hydrology. So we end up with much drier conditions, often clay conditions in the soil, which really makes it difficult to establish vegetation on. So it's important to get and we talk about this in the booklet, we give you more detail on where you can send soil samples to get the information you need about what your existing soils are so that you can match your plants to the soil conditions that you have. Um, the exposure, is it, is it full sun? Do you have some existing large trees? Um, understanding whether it's shade or, or full sun in selecting the plant material is, is critical. And um, how is it currently being maintained? Is someone, you know, and how will it be maintained? Is it, is it just the homeowner or as Kate said, in some cases, cases it's public works or something like that. Understand what uh, the capacity is for maintenance, such as what kind of equipment they have, what size mowers, um, things like that. So from the standpoint of that site prep, I talked about, you know, really understanding what the existing cover is. And there are a lot of invasive noxious uh, plants that become established on the, along these waterways. Uh, I have some pictures there on the right. Japanese knotweed is starting to really kind of move into our area. Um, it can take over um, riparian buffer areas very rapidly and it becomes a monoculture. Um, I listed here some other that are, you know, really common in the Lancaster area. And again, in the guidebook, we have a lot more detail on these invasives, photographs and information. And I'll show some of that at the end, uh, some resources so that would help you to identify what those plants are and what kind of uh, invasive capacity there is. So from the site preparation standpoint, before you actually plant then, we need to look at, you know, you wanna mow down if it's tall grasses or whatever the vegetation is, if it's uh, herbaceous in some form, you wanna mow it down and get it down to a level that you can actually plant into it and start to lay things out. Um, you wanna cut back um, some of the, you know, potentially some of the woody vegetation. To, to make space for, for the additional planting. And in some cases, if it is invasive, there needs to be herbicide or cutting or pulling out of those invasive plants following the guidelines for the specific species because it can vary depending on what that invasive is. 
And again, we have more detail of that in the, in the booklet. And then if there's any soil amendments that are needed, we really, in most cases, what we try to do is match the plant with the soil conditions so that you do not have to add soil amendments. Um, but in some cases, that might be something that the soil test would recommend. So this is something that I'm going to be talking about for the next couple minutes. And this is really kind of the key to the planting uh, approach that we have in the guidebook. And it's really two basic strategies that are broken down with some flexibility as to what can be in each of those, strat those two strategies. The first is the ground cover strategy. So what is the cover that you're going to have on the ground in the area where you want to plant your, your buffer? And we, we have, you know, there's, there's four options here. Um, ideally, we don't want to do mowed lawn, but we have it there. Um, in some cases, uh, residents really want to have mowed lawn and plant trees into it. And it's better to have trees in mowed lawn than no trees in a riparian buffer. Um, the next is the no mow. So this is, this is a strategy that we're using a lot, um, mostly because it gives us some flexibility. It gives us the option to be able to reduce maintenance. And it also provides, still provides more habitat and starts to create um, a, a define or a limit of where that riparian buffer is compared to where the mo mode area is. So we'll talk a little more about that. The next is creating and, and establishing a wildflower meadow or some type of, of uh, intentional native grass meadow or something like that. This is typically seeded. So what we would do is we would eradicate the existing cover and you would go in then and plant something that is very intentional to get more seasonal interest or a, more of a variety of, of uh, grasses. Again, this is the meadow is actually, we're looking at a seeded uh, strategy. And then the, the next one is a mixed herbaceous planting. So this might be a case where a resident, it's maybe a smaller property or something like that. And they really want to be more um, strategic in where they locate the plants or the herbaceous plants. So this is actually going in and planting into a, a prepared bed, uh, almost like a perennial planting, but using natives and wildflowers and grasses and things like that, uh, plugs or quartz or something like that, so that you get something more intentional in those areas. So those are the four ground cover strategies that we'd, we'd look at. The woody planting strategies then are the, are the trees and shrub planting. And we have three, three different approaches on that. One is, is shrubs, shrubs only, and we'll talk about the benefits and the pros and cons to that. The other is just trees. And then the, the third one is kind of a combination of, of both. And again, this is kind of a, a mix and match, depending on what, what your needs are, what your site looks like, and things like that. So this is that reduced maintenance, just establishing a no mow area. Um, this gives you an idea, you know, a lot of times in, for homeowners associations, especially, we look at this as a way of establishing a kind of a, a nice soft meadow um, area, but you can, you can start to create trails into that but it gives them the flexibility to be able to mow into that if they maybe they aren't, you know, might be pushing the limit and they want to make uh, more lawn area or extend it and kind of um, move it into uh, that open space over a period of time. So that's that flexibility that I was talking about from the no mow. Over time, as you can see in this picture, a lot of times the if you let the, you know, the cool season grasses, the lawn grasses grow, your, your perennials, your native perennials uh, will start to seed into that. But at the same time, your invasives will start to seed into that. So you have to still manage these no mow areas um, to encourage the, the you know, native wildflowers, but also at the same time, discouraging the, um, the invasives that might be starting to come in. Wildflower meadow, again, this is just kind of the example, but it's, um, when you seed with the wildflower meadow, you get a mix and the plants or the different wildflowers or grasses will settle into the space 
spaces within the buffer that they are most comfortable. So those that are the drier species are gonna settle into the drier areas. Those that are the wetter species will settle into the wetter, wetter areas. It's more of a much more naturalized approach. Um, it's not as strategic, but it, it can be very beautiful. Um, then the mixed perennial, and again, this just kind of gives you an idea on what that looks like, but it's actually planting in. It's kind of like you'd be planting a perennial bed. Typically what we do is we eradicate the, um, the grass, the existing cover. So if it's a lawn area as it is in this picture, that was just, there was Roundup sprayed um, once or twice to, to kill off the, the grasses. The grasses are left in place, it, the dead grass is left in place as almost kind of the ground cover. Um, and then the herbaceous is planted into that. This gives you a quicker, um, visual. I mean, you'll, you actually have something that looks nicer initially because the plants are greened up than you do with the, the seeded meadow. Seeded meadow takes, takes longer. It's more costly. But three years, four years down the road, both the wildflower meadow that's seeded and the mixed herbaceous planting are probably going to be looking pretty much the same unless you're very um, uh, hands-on with maintaining the herbaceous planting and want that to be a much more um, defined area. So then these wooding planting strategies. So the thing I wanna say about shrubs is they provide a great deal of habitat, really great for habitat, um, especially with the multifunctional buffers. There's a lot of berry uh, producing um, and fruit producing shrubs. So they, they really provide great habitat. What you have to remember with shrubs are that they buffer your vis vision. So if you plant a lot of shrubs along a stream, at first you're gonna see you know, the water because they're much smaller, but over time they can overtake and really create a visual screen. So it's really important to understand you know, what it is when you plant, what it's gonna look like down the road, but um, that's kind of the, you know, the main pros and cons with a shrub only uh, buffer. Trees, um, I think, you know, this is pretty simple. You know, your trees over time are gonna to start to grow up. They will still allow your visibility into the stream through the, the uh, trees, but they will start to create a canopy and start to shade out the understory. So. You need to understand that over time, the understory and what you have in your ground cover might need to change. Um, a lot of times, if it's a seeded meadow of some type, they will adapt to that, that shade. Um, if it is just the lawn or the no mow area, the cool season grasses will tend to start to dry, die back. So you may need to go back in and do some reseeding or additional planting as this buffer matures. And I'm, I'm talking maybe seven to 10 years when you start to get a canopy, depending on the size trees you put in. Um, and then the combination of trees and shrubs. Again, this is just very similar to, to what we talked about with the strategic approach with the herbaceous plants, but with the trees and shrubs, this allows you to kind of use the, maybe the shrubs for the habitat to do you screen some of the views, but then maybe the trees are in some areas to allow your views. When to plant. Um, this always comes up when, when's the best place, to, when's the best time to plant. Um, typically it's the spring or it's the fall. Um, those are the two main planting seasons. We talk about the pros and cons of each. The pro of the spring is that you, you, know, you have a longer growing season for the plants to start to get established and usually warmer temperatures. But one of the things you have to remember is that there's typically more rain, more water in the spring, and you are dealing with, you're talking about planting in a floodplain. So, you know, you need to kind of weigh out um, timing on, you know, is the spring the best time, depending on the, the conditions that you're looking at. The fall um, is a great time to plant, especially in riparian areas, as long as it doesn't get too far into the fall and you start to have, um, you know, really cold or frozen ground conditions. You can typically plant um, up until the ground is frozen. So the temperatures might be very cold, but as long as the ground is not frozen, you can still plant into it. And that's what's considered like a, a dormant planting. So the tree goes in and then it really starts to, 
to grow in the spring when the temperatures start to warm up and it's still a very good time to plant. Although there are certain tree species that have what they call fall hazard. And again, we have that in the booklet as kind of a note to make sure that you check to make sure that the species that you're proposing don't aren't a fall hazard, um, which those trees do not like to be planted in the fall um, because of the, the species that they are. So talking about layout, um, again, this, this really is a function of, we can talk about spacing, we can talk about um, an ideal uh, number of trees in a certain area, but it, what it comes down to really is what kind of maintenance you have, um, how you're gonna be maintaining it, and then strategically what, you, what you're trying to achieve. So in a lot of cases, large riparian buffer areas, we're trying to encourage and vigorous growth on the trees. And from that standpoint with maintenance, we're looking at making sure that we can get larger equipment into these areas to be able to mow and to um, easily um, keep the you know, invasives down or the, um, um, management of those. And then as far as spacing then between the species is, um, again, in the booklet, we have a guide for um, each, all the different tree species and the spacing. So it really depends on the tree that you're planting as to what the minimum spacing will be. And that is identified with each one of the, uh, the particular plants. So some of the small understory trees, say uh, service berry or red bud or something like that, you could probably space about 15 foot on center. Um, some of the deciduous hardwoods like an oak or a maple, you would probably wanna keep it about 20 foot on center. Um, but that doesn't mean that there are some other hardwoods that in some cases, some alders and things like that, we might plant sweet gum, can be planted very close together. And you can see that um, in some reforestation areas where they really try to establish these kind of uh, coves of, of uh, dense uh, trees. But again, it goes back to what, from a maintenance standpoint, what, what you're interested in, in establishing. So how to install, I'm not gonna go into all the details of planting. I'm gonna call out some of the things that we've learned over the years and what's in the booklet as to being kind of some critical things. When you locate the plants in the field, it's often helpful to, um, there's colored wire flags, uh, use those that match the different species. It just helps you um, to kind of lay out where you want the species, uh, the different trees for their different characters and just using colored flags helps with that a lot. Um, dig the hole twice the size of the container. Make sure that the soil around where the plant goes in is, is softer and looser so that that plant material can get the roots in and can get established. If you have a lot of clay in these floodplain areas and you just you just stick it in without that um, buffer around where it's planted, it, it can really kind of have a tough time. Um, don't plant too deeply. This is probably the biggest challenge we have, especially with volunteer planting, is that the trees go in the ground, they get, they get gung-ho with digging a hole and the tree goes in the ground. And you, you basically, if you plant too deeply, if you see on, that, on the right-hand side, you're, you're burning the collar of the tree and almost suffocating the tree, uh, right at the, which is right at the top of the roots. So um, the, the goal is to plant the tree right where the soil is um, on the, um, on either from the container or at the top of the ball. Um, so, and you don't wanna to go too high, but make sure it's at a correct depth, but don't go too deep. Um, Five tree shelters are recommended and we have a picture here and I know that everyone has seen the tree shelters uh, all around Lancaster County and probably throughout the Chesapeake Bay and, and other areas, but these are meant to help promote growth. Um, that's the plastic tube and the stake um, that you use with a small container seedling or, or bare root um, tree. The uh, tube 
promotes the growth, kind of protects the tree itself. And um, until it, it grows out of that, and um, the tree shelter should actually go into the ground, work it in about an inch below the surface so that it's kind of anchored in there, that it has a bit of an anchor. And it's especially important in areas uh, along the floodplains. The stake is, is tied and attached with zip ties. And then um, something, especially without tree shelters, um, the tree shelters also protect from deer and understanding what kind of wildlife and uh, uh, impacts that you might have on the vegetation is very important. And deer uh, definitely uh, can damage trees, especially in this area. And the, um, the tree tubes help with that. There are also different, and we have that in the booklet, some different uh, types of guards that can be put on the, on the seedlings if, if you aren't using tree poop tubes to protect from the deer damage. But we do like to use, put ribbons on the trees um, if, if it's planted into like a um, meadow of some type so that when you are maintaining it, that all the trees, you don't mow them down or whoever's maintaining it, it mows it down. So I'm going to go through this quick, but some of the typical maintenance then for NOMO. Maintenance overall with the buffers, if you get, take anything out of what we're talking about here, is that we look at doing what we can to suppress the invasives and those aggressive species. So whether it's going in and cutting them, mowing them down, strategically spraying them, um, or some, in some cases you're going in and, and um, string trimming those, it's suppressing them so that the native plants can really start to get established. Um, that is probably the key to in most cases. And then, you know, the, um, you know, the maintenance on a, on a no mow area is really, that's, that's kind of the bottom line um, with that because you already have your cool season grass established. If you seed a meadow and you're trying to establish a variety of grasses and wildflowers, it's going to be um, our biggest thing with when these types of meadows are seeded is that they are not mowed too short. Um, you can really uh, push back the success of these seeded meadows if after the, you know, even during the first growing season, sometimes it's, the seed comes up sporadically, people get a little nervous or they don't like the look of it and they go in and they'll mow it down. That can be the worst, it can be a death wish for, the, um, for those seeded areas because that, as those small um, seeds start to propagate and start to grow, they really rely on um, the sun and that top growth to establish their root systems. And by cutting that off, it really starts to stun it. So during the first year, we look at a height of no shorter than 10 inches. So going in, maybe string trimming off some of the seed heads if you don't like the look or something like that. Um, spot treating those invasives. And then maybe in the late winter or early spring, you can mow down to a four to six inch, but not during the growing season. Um, tree and shrub planting, you know, some of the big things with this really is in the first year to five years, especially uh, while the trees are getting established is making sure that the area right around the base of the tree that there is not vegetation in that, in that area. Um, we actually look at establishing a spray ring and you can kind of see it over here. This isn't the best picture, but right in the middle of the picture on the right, you can see there's a bare ground area around the tree. This is for purposes of keeping voles um, and from chewing. They love the cover of vegetation and even some mulches and they go in and actually will uh, in the winter and will feed and take those small seedling trees out. We see a lot of damage with this. So that is the reason that we clear that four to six foot ring around those trees during the first um, at least three years um, to five years until that tree gets established and the voles can't, can't um, affect them. 
And again, the focus is on those noxious and invasive plants and um, looking at uh, mowing between the shelters, um, again, to control that, that growth, depending on what it is. Your herbaceous planting, this is pretty much more like a, uh, a perennial, perennial garden planting. You may need to water this. Um, if it is a very dry, if you think about it, these uh, plants are used to a, a nursery type condition and especially if they're plugs. Um, so if you're in a really dry condition and especially if the soils are clay or um, dry, that could really, um, uh, if it's not watered, it could really affect it. And then the removal of the invasive volunteers pretty much um, all across the board, most important. So in the booklet, we also have a guide um, for the, all the different trees. So you don't have to take notes on all of this. We aren't gonna go through all the different species, um, but the booklet defines the, the different species that we recommend of trees, uh, the height that they get, the spread that they get, and um, that WIS is the wetland indicator. Um, and that just tells you like FACU means that it's faculative upland. That means it takes drier conditions. Whereas uh, FACW is, um, is, takes wetland conditions. So we have the information here that will help you to be able to select the right plant for the right place. So we have that for the herbaceous species, um, the shrubs. And then we also gave some examples of some shade seed mixes um, that can be used. And then a shade wildflower seed mix that you might wanna use in an area that has some part shade or some existing uh, shade cover. And then a um, sun wildflower seed mix that could be used. Um, and this one kind of is more towards those that might be kind of a wetland pocket or something like that. So this is a list of uh, additional resources. Again, it's, it's, we have this in the booklet, but we just wanna show you that, that we have a pretty extensive list of different um, groups that have more information, uh, different native plant nurseries, um, a lot more information on riparian buffers and uh, identification of invasive plants. And then finally, I just wanna kind of leave with um, some of these <clears throat> really, you know, critical invasive plants that we see a lot in Lancaster in our riparian areas. Um, poison hemlock, seeing so much of it right now um, along our waterways and in our natural areas. Shrub honeysuckle, it really starts to take over. Multiflora rose, this uh, lesser celadine is, it, it really creates a very dense cover um, ground cover that makes it very difficult for, for more variety and more biodiversity. Japanese knotweed, um, if, if you see this starting to come in anywhere, it's try and eradicate it right away and stay on top of it. Um, it's very challenging to get rid of once it, it gets a foothold and it loves our, our stream banks. Japanese stilt grass, again, very common. Um, Tree of Heaven, and probably everyone understands the, uh, the relationship of Tree of Heaven and Spotted Lanternfly. It's a, it's a host tree. Um, it's also it, an invasive and noxious tree that is pretty common on a lot of our waterways. So with that, I am going to turn it back over to Kelly and uh, we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Kelly, and uh, to Kate as well. This is just such an informative presentation. Um, I would love to open up to com uh, some conversations and questions from the audience right now. Um, to ask a question of Kelly or Kate at this time, please feel free to use that Q&A button on your screen, um, and we'll get through as many as we can here in the next few, few minutes. Um, so we have our first question here from Lee. How do you deal with ice scour of the riparian buffer during spring flooding? You said ice scour. Ice scour. Yeah, you mentioned that spring flooding can be so challenging uh, when planting a new riparian buffer in the spring. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that, yeah, I'm not aware of any of, of 
our particular projects that have a have had a big issue with that. Um, but I am guessing that if if it is along one of the larger waterways that you have a lot of ice impact, you may want to look at doing more um, shrub and herbaceous planting um, in those areas because the shrubs can be sometimes they can be shaved off um, pretty low and they will come back uh, pretty rapidly. But that would that would probably be my best response. I don't know, Kate. Do you have any other? No, I yeah, I I can't say I have a lot of experience with with ice scour, and so yeah, I think that. I, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense what you just covered. Great. Our next question comes from Andy. Uh, first off, he says, great presentation. Uh, he's wondering if you know of any financial resources for private property owners to install buffers. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, I mean, I can talk about, so in the, in the city of Lancaster, we currently have a grant from DCNR for installing riparian buffers and, um, and residential properties would be eligible um, for, for some of that funding. There's also funding available um, through, uh, there's multiple resources. There's actually a lot of, there's, there's a, a good bit of money out there for trees right now, especially if it's a larger, um, if it's a larger property. Um, I know that the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay has um, funding for, um, for riparian buffer installations. The Chesapeake Bay Foundation has, um, uh, right, restoration specialists all over the state um, that work with landowners um, on buffer installations and the Clean Water Fund um, also has funding available for smaller projects. And so that might be a source to look at for, um, for a residential project. Any other ones that you can think of, Kelly, that I'm missing? That's all, but I think that we could include, I'm gonna have to check, but I think we can include some of those resources in what we send out with the, uh, with the booklet. Yeah, Definitely. absolutely. I would also suggest touch and base with your local watershed group. Um, they can absolutely help you um, to connect with some of the grants that are out there. Um, and uh, and, uh, and it's a, just a great resource and a good group of volunteers to get in touch with. It's a really great point, Kate. And uh, just as a reminder to everyone listening today, we will be sending out a recording of today's webinar um, with all the resources that Kelly and Kate are mentioning here, including um, a link to the buffer design guide. Um, our next question um, relates to um, kind of options to try to eradicate invasives or manage some of those unwanted herbaceous plants um, without the use of Roundup. Are there um, other ways to do that that are successful um, and will lead to a successful buffer being installed? I, I think one of the, and I, I just saw this up on the Delaware River um, a couple of weeks ago, but um, where residents are basically putting black plastic down and they had, I don't know where they got their black plastic, but they had it, their entire bank for their riparian buffer, they had black plastic down too. Um, that basically will kill off the vegetation underneath it. I'm not sure how long you have to leave it, leave the plastic down. And, um, but I know that that has been a pretty successful approach. Fantastic. That's, uh, that's one great option. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing that information, Kelly. I think another thing, if you're, you know, it's really important to understand what the invasive is and understand what you need to do to eradicate it. So in some cases, I know there's a lot of groups that go in and spend a lot of time string trimming down knotweed. And if you don't just, if you only string trim it down, it looks good for you know a couple of weeks, but you are not gonna get rid of it. It's gonna come back stronger than ever. So you have to do a regimen of string trim. I, and I don't know what all it is, but there's string trimming, there's spraying. I think there's burning in some cases. Um, but some of these invasives are very, very prolific. So you have to know what you're working with. That's, that's such a good point. Uh, we have a question from Carol. Um, she wants to know if an HOA wants to take on a riparian buffer for a retention pond situation, would this guide apply or are there any additional things you might want to consider when establishing a retention pond buffer? I think that's kind of the goal of the guide. I mean, it's it's focused on buffers, but we really have a, have 
kind of establish these different types of planting strategies that could be applied really anywhere. Um, you know, if you want to convert a lawn area or reforest a certain area, I mean, we're focusing on on riparian areas, but there's no reason why you couldn't couldn't apply maybe the you know the seeded wildflower meadow or something like that for a detention basin. And you just go through the same process. You have to understand what the soils are. You have to understand what the hydrology is. What type of basin is it? Um, does it hold a lot of water for a long period of time? Then you might want to look at something different. But um, that's, that's kind of the goal of this, is to start to look at a way that we have flexible strategies that can be applied in different areas. We have time for one last question here from Dan. Um, he's wondering about a strategy for po um, of partnering with local school districts to work on riparian buffers. He references um, his school district is in York County, has a 68 acre property that used to be a golf course with a stream running through it. Do you, um, Kelly or Kate, have any suggestions on how to push things in the right direction with the school district? Yeah, I'll take a uh, take a stab at it, and Kelly, please you know, jump in as well. Um, yeah, I think there's great opportunities to partner with school districts on projects like this, and I think school districts are a perfect opportunity of an organization that is trying to maintain a large amount of land and um, and probably has a pretty limited budget to do it with, and um, so I think that having some of those those early conversations about some of the benefits of a riparian buffer and how it could really help reduce over time their certainly their mowing costs um, and you know and over time potentially reduce their maintenance costs. Um, you know, obviously it will require buffers require maintenance as well, um, but um, but it is a you know kind of a different type of a different type of strategy. But I think that could be a real benefit to schools. Um, as well as being a great educational opportunity for, for schools. Um, and so I think that that sounds like a really, a really great partnership to, um, to forge. And so we've had success in working with the school district of Lancaster, um, working with the facilities director for, um, for the district. Um, uh, sometimes having a teacher who, you know, can really be a champion of a project like this can be really fantastic um, and can help make those connections um, and, or else a, a champion could be the principal of the school. Um, and so I think there's, there's a number of different, um, you know, uh, different people to approach. Um, but I think a key thing is having the, uh, the facilities staff on board because they're gonna be the ones who are caring for it in the long term. Well, thank you for that answer, Kate, and thank you to Kelly as well for this great presentation. I would love to just uh, take a moment now to turn it back over to my colleague, Fritz, just for a final word as we wrap up this presentation today. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Kate. I want to personally recognize the incredible work the City of Lancaster is undertaking to reduce combined sewer overflows by utilizing green infrastructure, including riparian buffers. Your collaboration with many partners, including land studies, is helping to transform how we as a community look at stormwater management and our local streams and rivers. Your in-depth knowledge of invasive plant site preparation, planting strategies, and maintenance dovetail with our number one action step for Lancaster Water Week, which is to create habitat, plant native trees, shrubs, and flowers. Not only is this improvement good for capturing rainwater, it also benefits the birds and the bees. If you have additional questions about transforming your property and you live in the city, you can reach out to Kate. If you have large scale projects, land studies will be a great resource. I also wanna make you aware of a Lancaster Conservancy initiative called Community Wildlife Habitat, where one of our trained volunteers will visit your property to provide free advice and refer you to a proper professional to assist with your needs. Thank you for tuning in this afternoon and happy Water Week.